I'm going to speak to you about hope that we have. If there's one thing we require in this world that we live in is hope. Amen, church? Um, if you agree with me, you're more than welcome to say amen. Luke chapter 8, reading from verse 43. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed in any way, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those who were with him said, Master, the multitudes throng you and press you. And you say, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody touched me. For I perceive power going from me. One thing we require in our lives serving the Lord is desperation. How desperate are you for God? How hungry are you for God? This woman was in a hopeless state. The Bible says she had a flow of blood. Some, uh, some translations will say a, an issue of blood. If you have to bring it in um, today's age, she probably had a continuous menstruation problem. And she spent everything she had. She, she used up every little bit of money, possessions she had to try and get herself healed. And I want, I want you to know that the physicians that we have today are way more advanced. The medical facilities that we have are way more advanced. And yet she stands, and she's hoping to get through to Jesus. The Bible speaks about a multitude surrounding him. Wherever Jesus went, he always drew a crowd. And she couldn't reach to him. She couldn't touch him and liaise with him and tell him her problem. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. You might be in that situation this morning where you're faced with a desperate, hopeless situation. All he requires from you is to touch the hem of his garment. You don't even have to touch his hand. Just purpose in your heart, I want to touch the hem of his garment. They did a study on that, and it's quite, quite amazing. I don't know much about it, but all I know is that apparently the hem of his garment had a, 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 a purple thread of cotton woven through it. And purple speaks of kingship. So she said, if I could just touch the hem of the king. And when she did it, something happened. The Bible says, immediately, immediately, not three years down the line, not after she had to sit under the word of God and gain faith. The Bible says, immediately, she was healed. And Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? You see, when you're desperate enough for Jesus, he's going to stop. You're going to get his attention. If you're desperate enough, he's going to stop. I heard a, a story in the week. Uh, someone was telling me about a, a traffic officer, uh, a lady that had stopped another lady. And um, she carried out her duties. I think it was on Facebook or something like that. I'm not sure. And the lady that she pulled over decided to drive away. And this traffic officer did this. She jumped on the bonnet of the car. And she held on until the woman stopped. When you, hey, do you remember that story? When you're desperate enough, you will get God's attention. He wants you to get his attention. Let me just say this here. You know, I shared in the, in the Bible study, and I tell you, I really want to encourage you guys, come to these Bible studies. I promise you, while the wealth of knowledge, you know, I spoke, on, I spoke a little bit on, on, on the law, and I, I came to learn that Andre is actually a lawyer, 
And I spoke to him, the, the, Andre is the guy that came to speak up here now. And I spoke to him, I said, Would, can you verify what I'm saying? Because I'm not a lawyer. And he came up and he spoke and he said, yo, you're 100% correct. So we're learning a lot from these Bible studies. It's not just for you to join. It is mandatory for you to join the church. But if you just want to learn the word of God and grow, it's a wonderful opportunity. In fact, we've got some people from other churches that have come as well, which is great. You've got to be desperate enough. You've got to be kingdom-minded. So here she was. She reached out to him. God wants you to reach out. Be desperate enough to reach out. He is not going to sit here and wave a magic wand of the word over you. He wants you to come towards him. The Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. When he looked at Peter, he said to Peter, come. And the minute Peter decided to get out of the water, a man who knew the power of the ocean, he knew it was impossible. He was a fisherman. He knew it was impossible to walk on the water. But when Jesus said, come. Church, let me tell you something. When Jesus says to you, come, you come. You don't sit back. You don't hold back. You forget about the natural elements. When Jesus said you do something, let me just say this. If Jesus said to you, you're going to live and not die, you will live and not die. Whether or not you've got a heart that's pumping, that doesn't matter. When Jesus said you will live and not die, you will live and not die. Amen. Because his word is his bond. Yeshua was extending herself. Not bothered about the crowd. Not worried about what people are going to say about me. I'm going to go and I'm going to extend myself before him. And because of obedience, the Bible says God honors obedience above the sacrifice. Because of her obedience, she was healed immediately. Don't underestimate the power of God, church. John chapter 5. The word of God says, after this, from verse 1, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, by the gate, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrews, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in it first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who, was, who had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time. He said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. I hope you have a stomach for what I'm about to tell you now. I hope you have strong guts. This scenario is not speaking about Bella Bella. Or Varambat, or Warm Baths, or the Wild Coast, where we have a couple of ladies and gentlemen lying in, uh, in our bathing costumes, trying to catch a tan, hitting the waves. This was a cesspool, a place where filth and dirt reigned. People were lying around like legumes, like seals, broken in pieces. Can you imagine the, 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 those who, who had leprosy, the leprosy, the flies, the maggots feeding from these people? They were waiting for the stirring of the water. And only once a year, someone will draw the lottery and the angel will come and stir the water and one person wins. This man was lying there for 38 years in this condition. Wow, 38 years. It's a generation. It's a whole generation. And yeah, he waited for this angel. Can you imagine? Perhaps he was one of those that when the, when the waters were stirred, that he was a second just too late. 
because somebody jumped in before him. A second just too late. And then he didn't make it. And then they had to maybe throw ropes to him to haul him back out of the pool. To wait and lie there another year for the angel to come and stir the water. And maybe he's lying there and he's beginning to think, well, you know, last year this time the angel came. Maybe, I, I'm not even quite sure when is that day. So they're waiting in anticipation for the angel to come and stir the water. But he doesn't quite know when that is going to happen. And then the angel comes and he thinks, here's my chance. And he tries to, to get himself there because he's lame. He can't get there. He doesn't have someone to take him. And as he throws himself into the pool, Someone else beat him to it. And again, he's got to wait. And the cycle continues. Eventually, he just lays there. In a hopeless condition, church, let me tell you something. With Jesus, there's hope. Amen? And guess what happens? The master walks on the scene. And he comes to him, and the master says to him, Would you like to be healed? What a question. I mean, that seems like an inappropriate question. Of course. But because of his condition, this man was so comfortable. You better understand that this man had people coming to him to feed him on a daily basis. Maybe he needed to use the toilet and they had to, ro to haul him up to the toilet on a daily basis. So he became comfortable in the situation. How many of you here this morning are comfortable in your situation? It's a whole generation. And if I don't have my problem anymore, nobody's going to worry about me. Nobody's going to bring me food. Nobody's going to make sure that I'm clothed. So you know what? I'd rather just take my problem and baby my problem. I begin to stroke the situation. I start entertaining my situation instead of allowing God to come in and changing it. And the master rocks up on the scene and he says, do you wish to be healed? You know what he turns around? Corne, 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 corneta. He says, I do not have a man. Let me tell you something. When you look to man, you will be disappointed. When you look to man, you will be disappointed. I know I've been there, done that. Got the t-shirts, you know? And don't believe people when they say to you, listen, I've got your back. No ways, man. It ain't going to happen. You turn to your family, your family will let you down. You turn to your wife, your wife will let you down. You turn to your husband, your husband will let you down. There's only one person you can tamper on, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. He will never, ever let you down. Jesus Christ. The man among men. Oh, I just love him. Jesus says to him, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. Wow. Man, what a man. What a man. What a mighty good man. What a man, man. And he says we need to model him. He is the one that we got to model. We must model Jesus. We need to model Jesus Christ. It just so happens and I'm not, this is for another teaching, another day, okay? The Bible says, and that day happens to be the Sabbath day. We'll just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> we won't even go there because that's another problem. I don't know why Jesus does this. The last passage of scripture I want to go to, and then I'm going to close and I'm going to pray with people. John chapter 8. I know many of us are very, very familiar with this passage of scripture. But I'm going to encourage you. My favorite chapter in the entire Bible, is John chapter 8. I just love it. When you read through the, the book of John chapter 8, you will see why I love it so much. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when he had set her, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses 
in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear them. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted of the, by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in, in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. What a powerful passage. You know, many of us find ourselves sometimes in the judgment seat. And we tell God, it's time for you to get off the throne. Let me do the judging. Ma um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. We all know that scripture. Right, Donald? Even you will know that scripture. Even you, my buddy. It says, judge not, lest you be judged. In other words, if you're not prepared to be judged by other people, then don't judge other people. Simple as that. Take the log out of your own eye before you want to complain and see the dust in someone else's eye. Amen? Why? Because we all missed it. We've all made our mistakes. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's because of His grace that we are today. But nevertheless, Jacques, I don't want to get carried away, but I want to come back to the story. They bring this woman. Now, I wanted a chair to put this, but there was a chair there. I wanted to bring a chair for this particular demonstration but the bible says when he came from the mount of olives he entered into the temple and he sat down and he started teaching and then the religious rulers the pharisees the sadducees the sanhedrin the religious people the rulers of the day the, the scribes the lawyers whatever they brought this woman to jesus and they threw her in the midst of the people imagine the type of shame she must have had. Imagine the pain she must have gone through. And yet to be so badly ridiculed, to be ostracized, to be brought in front of a group of people, religious people. Let me tell you something. The worst thing ever is to be found in front of a group of religious people to be judged by. And yet they brought this woman and they said to her, teacher, teacher they're mocking him because you know what jesus didn't have the degrees that they had they were lawyers let me tell you something the lawyers of that day were very very afraid with this with the the torah with the pentateuch the five books of the old testament they were well afraid with that especially the law of moses and they said according to the law of moses she must be stoned. You know what Jesus did? This is the fascinating thing. Keenan, do me a favor. Just bring me a chair quickly. When he came into the temple and he started teaching the words of the Old Testament, he was sitting down and he was teaching the people. When they brought this woman in their midst, you know what the Bible said? He stooped down and he started writing on the ground. And when I was reading that, a revelation came to me. Now, there's a lot of speculation of what was he writing on the ground. Maybe he was writing all their sins down. You know, you're quick to judge. He was writing all the sins down. But I firmly believe that what he did was identify with this woman. She was at her lowest. 
And the only place that she could feel comfortable was to have someone with her, Helen, in her lowest. So you know what she does? He goes onto the ground and he begins to write in the dirt. Because that's where she was, in the dirt. I don't think he wrote down their sins. He's not interested in their sins. They were too pious. They were too holy. They didn't have any sins. They had the stones ready to stone this woman. They had the stones. And you know what? He makes a profound statement. He says to her, to them, he says, He among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Who was among, among them all that was without sin? No, there was one person. It was Jesus. He took that whole situation and he deflected it, reflecting on himself. He said, let me, who is without sin, cast the first stone. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a revelation? You know what? They threw their stones down and they walked out. You know something? Just as a matter of interest, it takes two to tango. Where's the other party? Okay. We're not even going to go down that route, but where's the, where's the guy? They only brought the woman. Where's the guy? But that's not important in this message. He among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Amen. Jesus was the only one qualified enough to cast that stone. But you know what he did? He looked up. He stooped down again a second time. He went down to the ground again. And this time, to bring her up, he says, Lady, where are those who accuse you? Where are they? Maybe at this time, her hair, those days they wore her, their hair long, especially, you know, the working ladies. They wore their hair long. Maybe she had her hair all long, so she was looking at the ground all the time. But this time... She looks up and she says, I have none accusers anymore. And Jesus says, well, then I'm not going to accuse you either. Go your way and sin no more. That's the God we serve. Church, it does not matter. It does not matter how colorful your background is. Let me tell you that much. I don't care how bad a sinner you may have been in your yesteryears. But let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ comes, I told, I shared this truth, and I'm going to share it quickly, and I'm going to close. It's a, it's a nugget that I learned. You know, the Bible says, first of all, do you know that when you ought against someone, you can forgive that person? Am I right, Lucio? You can forgive. Right, Benedicta? We forgive people. But, Debbie, we don't often forget what they've done to us. Am I right? Am I right, Rudy? They don't often forget. You will always remember what that man did to you. I've forgiven him, but I'll never, I'll never forget him. I'll never forget him, but I'll never forget him. But God says, I will forgive you. And even further, I will choose to remember your sins no more. <laughs> it's only God that can do that. Do you know men of God that have fallen in many years, in decades, and have repented and still ministering the gospel, people still hold them accountable? That you, oh, he's the same guy that had that, 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 blah, blah, blah. Amen. And yet... You take that situation to Jesus, Terry. You take the situation to Jesus, and Jesus said, what are you talking about? I can't even remember that. I don't have a record of that. Why? Because the Bible says he's taken our iniquity and has cast it as far as the east is from the west. And guess what? Those two poles never meet. That's where God throws our iniquities. And the Bible says, 
He chooses to remember our sins no more forever. No more forever. Amen. Let's stand and give him a praise offering this morning.